Welcome to The Drum, I'm Steve Kinane. Coming up, what about the workers? A Labor Premier claims the Prime Minister is being heavy-handed over workplace safety laws. Own goal, allegations that FIFA officials are willing to sell their World Cup bid votes for money. And later in the show, the man who took on the Murdoch Empire and won. Bruce Guthrie, author of Man Bites Murdoch, will be our guest. Our panel tonight, Shane McLeod from ABC Radio's The World Today, Michael Gleeson from Hawker Britain, and Sue Cato, Principal of Cato Council. Thanks for coming in, guys. Well, first up tonight, the federal government will soon be releasing children from immigration detention centres. Unaccompanied minors and families with children will be able to live in community-based accommodation while they wait for their refugee applications to be processed. Prime Minister Julia Gillard says the measures have been driven by the government, not the Greens. Uh, it's a recognition that the government wants to be transparent about its long-term detention strategy. Uh, it's a recognition uh, that in the uh, interests of children and families that may be at, uh, have some risk factors, uh, that we do want to make use of the Migration Act powers, which enable a Minister for Immigration to take this step. Prime the Prime Minister also announced that there will be two new immigration detention centres, one at Northam, north of Perth, and in Inverbrackie near Woods Woodside in the Adelaide Hills. It's estimated they'll be able to accommodate, accommodate around 2,000 people in the facilities. Now, Ms Gillard's announcement came after pressure from Greens. Senator Sarah Hanson-Young. Ms Hanson-Young says she has concerns about building new immigration detention centres. I am concerned that simply building new detention centres without a... Uh, an amendment to the Migration Act which restricts the amount of time that somebody can be held in immigration detention will not simply solve the problem. We need to make sure that before we build any new centres, before there is an expansion of the immigration detention network, that there is strict time frames on the length of time people can be detained. The government's own policy is 90 days. Obviously that has not been adhered to. We need to make sure the Migration Act says they must. Now, Michael Gleeson, the issue of uh, getting children out of detention, why is Labor doing that? Is it because of it's a moral issue, they believe in it, or is it because it helps with their overcrowding problem? Oh, well, I think probably a bit of both, Steve. In reality, uh, I think there are many people in the ALP who have been concerned for a long time about children behind barbed wire fences. I mean, the, the, the reality of the numbers of the parliament, that, though, now make it much easier for them to, the, to be able to move this policy. They know it will get through the upper house. It is highly likely to get through the lower house. And it's possible now. And, um, you know, it, it's good policy. The policy of the last decade or so, in my view, has been, has been appalling policy. And um, uh, we've heard plenty of evidence in recent time about psycholo psychologists and psychiatrists being concerned about how detention centres affect young people. This is a good move today by the government. Sue, what's driving it? Well, look at the politics. I mean, I agree with Michael, but can you imagine if they'd announced two new detention centres? on its own, without talking about kids and families um, being out. I mean, it was very smart for them to actually do it. I mean, for Gillard, and I should be talking like this, but for, <laughs> for, for, sorry, for Gillard to actually announce that uh, it had nothing to do with the Greens when they've been perfectly able to announce this policy for some time, I think it's a bit shallow, but I just think it's... And know, the Greens almost announced this policy, didn't they, Shane, like they on Saturday? They tried to on the weekend, yeah. yeah. They were certainly trying to get out ahead of the government. But it does seem there's a little bit of this in... A little bit of, every, a little bit of this in this for everyone. There's something in it for everyone. I mean, there is uh, the, the follow-through. I mean, essentially, Labor's been talking about getting kids and families out of detention since 2008. Um, it's taken them a couple of years to get there. And the but, current proposal, how, how's that going to work? Well, it's going to happen over nine months, I think, so it's not going to be an immediate thing. You're not suddenly going to have people, 700 children, I think, uh, mm. is the current figure, are in detention. They're not going to be getting out of these centres, walking out tomorrow. It's going to happen over some time, and you can imagine why that is, because it's probably going to take a bit of time to find places. Yeah, for these people. The, babies, the babies conceived today might live in freedom. And they're going to have churches, I think, and charities running them. That's I, right, Shane. I, I that's think the plan. that's the F. They're, they're looking to community organisations, people c who can help these people settle into communities and, assumedly, um, in some fairly um, far-flung parts of Australia compared to where people are being kept now. Michael, in response to the development that uh, two new detention centres will be open, Tony Abbott today said uh, in Question Time that this, this, uh, how will opening more beds stop more boats? That's the line he's taking on this? Well, he obviously doesn't realise that the election's over. Um, you know, we're not fighting an election now. This is a government that's there to govern and it's taking decisions that uh, are proper decisions. I mean, clearly, if there are more people coming into the country, then they have to be uh, put somewhere. And um, it seems to make a lot of sense, quite frankly, to build two new detention centres as well as move those people out of the detention centres who are no risk to the community 
and for their own good mental health. Um, you know, it doesn't surprise me that he's banging that drum, quite frankly, but, I, you know, I think that um, he's a couple of months too late. Clever brand placement then, uh, Michael. <laughs> but, I mean, let's see, I mean, what was Abbott's alternative? You know, he couldn't back the government, he couldn't endorse the strategy, um, couldn't probably criticise the two extra detention centres, given their policies. So, I mean, you know, and he thinks he's speaking to 50% of the electorate by... Um, the appalling claptrap of Stop the Boats. Well, here's what um, the Shadow Immigration Minister Scott Morrison said about the announcement today. Uh, this government just doesn't understand that opening more beds does not stop more boats. It's that simple. Uh, this is a government that said it wouldn't be expanding its onshore detention network before the election, and since the election they've announced 3,300 beds. Uh, this is a government also that once again failed to outline what the costs would be of these additional 2,300 beds they've announced today. And he also wants um, the Prime Minister to get on the phone to the President of Nauru as well. Still waiting for the call. Gee, another huge shock there. A bombshell. Well, <laughs> there will be stronger protection for journalists and whistleblowers if independent MP Andrew Wilkie gets his way. He's introduced the first private members' bill of the new parliament and under the new rules, politicians now have more time to debate private members' bills in parliament where the five crossbenchers will be crucial to the success or failure of key bills. Mr Wilkie has secured government support for his bill, which would prevent journalists being forced to reveal their sources unless there is an overriding public interest. To give an example of how it might help people, uh, uh, in 2004, two senior journalists from the Herald Sun, um, they had a, a confidential source. Uh, it was to do with a leak of information to do with veterans' entitlements. Um, when the Commonwealth started to investigate the source of the leak, that was the basis for their stories in the Herald Sun newspaper, two journalists, Harvey McManus, refused to disclose the source and they were held in contempt of court and both fined $7,000. This legislation today will stop that occurring. And Shane, it's no surprise it took an independent to no. bring this uh, bill into power, into, exactly. also into Parliament. <laughs> well, I think probably both sides of politics look at this and know that there may be situations where they might find themselves in a difficult position because of uh, a journalist getting hold of a leak. But I think th what, what is interesting is this is the way Parliament is now going to operate. You're going to have the potential that any MP could bring forward a potential private member's bill that might deal with one of these issues. And this is one of those areas where... People have campaigned for many years for something to happen, but it's not exactly the sort of thing that you'll see a political party standing up and saying, yep, this will this will get us lots of votes, let's stand up there and protect um, journalists and whistleblowers. And so we've got some kind of inkling on how the opposition's going to use private members' bills. Uh, Christopher Pine is introducing one to have a judicial inquiry into the building the education revolution. I think we're probably going to see both sides using this tactic. So where they've got a pet issue or where they're watching an independent with a pet issue which they think that they can score a point against the other side on. So, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a political weapon. Hopefully we might see some good policy out of it. Um, but, but I suspect we're just saying, you know, it's day one mm. and we're already watching it in action, so I think more fun to be had. Mm. Kids with new toys, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Watch this space. You know, kaboom. <laughs> but, um, it's interesting for me, though, in terms of talking about public interest. I mean, who actually determines what's in public interest? And if you're looking at, you know, uh, you're looking at leaks, you're looking at stories, mm. and if you're really, really wanting to talk about um, freedom of press and, and journalists actually doing a great job... You know, if you're going to a journalist with a rip of yarn, something that, a story that needs to be told, and you're going, yeah, well, you know, who's going to make a call whether this is public interest or not? I mean, it's, it's an interesting mm. area. It could get very interesting if it was, for example, defence or intelligence. That would Absolutely. make it a, a very interesting area and yeah. what's the public right to know. And Monday is going to be the day when they're going to be introducing those private members' bills whenever Parliament's sitting. And the Gillard government could face another parliamentary defeat after Adam Bant said he would support a move to demand confidential modelling of Labor's taxation policies. Opposition Treasury spokesman Joe Hockey today, today submitted a motion to the House calling for the government to publicly reveal the costings and background working papers behind the Henry Tax Review. Greens MP Adam Bant says he will support that move. So um, what do you make of that, that Michael? That, uh... Well, look, uh, Adam Bant is clearly showing that he's got a degree of independence and uh, he's exercising it. Uh, I don't, I don't think the government needs to panic about this. Um, you know, we're the first couple of months into a new term. Um, I don't see any problem with that actually being released. And, um, you know, I think everyone just needs to take a bit of a cold shower, you know, when these sort of stories come up. You know, invariably they'll last two or three days and then, um, you know, we'll move on to some other issue. Um, but, you know, I think Adam Bant flexing his muscles a bit and, um, and it won't hurt, I guess, for the opposition to see that they might have 
some support from the crossbenchers occasionally. And uh, this is letting the sunshine in, isn't it, Shane? Uh, well, you know, uh, who knows what we could get hold of, <laughs> courtesy of a, uh, a motion in Parliament. It, it's interesting, though, the way that you can see how the pressure might come now on the government to do these things, even though, you know, they could say, well, sorry, no, we're not going to do that, or for some national interest reason we're not going to release it. But there will be these opportunities for political pressure, and the independents will be able to flag their take on it as well, which may be the sort of thing that actually leads the government to say, we are going to release that. And so if Joe Hockey's private member's bill gets up, that means we'll get to see the inner workings and the modelling behind the mining tax? Well, you'd think so. I'd also like to see the inner workings and the modelling behind the uh, opposition's... Um um, promises in the last campaign. I suspect we might be waiting a little while. But um, good on you, Joe. It will be interesting to see if he puts forward them. The Murray-Darling Basin Authority has bowed to public pressure and announced plans to carry out research into how planned water cuts would affect country towns. There's been widespread anger in the bush about draft guidelines to cut water allocations by up to 37%. The authority says it's heard the message loud and clear from locals. Sue, should this have happened earlier, do you think? Well, you know, you talk about mismanagement. I mean, I think um, probably the authorities um, had a bit of a beating on it. I mean, the reality is the authority was set up to provide the science on it, not the politics. And quite frankly, the authority should have nothing to do with the politics. So you could argue, should the government have been waiting in... Sorry, waiting, sorry. That the government <laughs> should have been... Um, should have been involved in, uh, in the community consultation side of it all. So really, if you look at it, you think this has been going a very long time and now we're doing the social impact work? I mean, there was always going to be the community backlash that we're seeing now, so it's a mess. Well, that, yeah, that backlash was large and we saw, of course, people um, burning <coughs> uh, the draft copies of the guidelines. That was in Griffith, there you can see there. You don't see that in Australia that often. No, they, they didn't really burn very well, you have to say. I, mean, I don't know what they're making the reports out of. They might be plastic Maybe it's too glossy, maybe, yeah. But it, it, it is a sign people are pretty upset about this. And yeah. I think um, certainly the thing we've been picking up in a lot of reports is people don't feel they've been spoken to enough about this. And that social, the 